Okay, so hi, I'm Dr. Amrita Shungarpati Zoshi. We'll be discussing cardiac output monitoring. It's an extremely tricky topic. No matter how many times you read it, it still ends up leaving so many doubts in our heads. So I will just try and simplify it as much as I can. And then, you know, uh, you can keep reading it. And every time you read it, it will add new information in your uh, head about the topic. Okay, so what is cardiac output monitoring and why do we need it? So cardiac output monitoring is basically to assess the uh, function of the heart and how it can be improved. So how much is the heart ejecting, whether it can be improved by giving fluids or whether you want to add any inotropes, or I, which is going to help improve the contractility or uh, you need to, uh, the patient is too vasodilated and you need to vasoconstrict the patient. So these are the things that you need to decide about the management of the patient, which will help you optimize the care of the patient. And it is because of this that it is important to monitor the cardiac output. So most of your very senior professors in the OT will be like, hum jab OT mein rahte te, hand on pulse and that was the only way of monitoring. And from that, we have come to really advanced stages of monitoring. Now, this advanced stages of monitoring also initially were really invasive. And now we are trying to move from the invasive monitoring to non-invasive monitoring. Okay. So our goal for cardiac output monitoring is patient-centered hemodynamic monitoring because we know that one rule doesn't apply for all in any patient. So correct therapeutic decisions. You cannot give fluid to a patient who actually needs a vasoconstrictor. You cannot vasoconstrict a patient who actually is dependent on fluid or who needs an inotrope. So you need to know what exactly needs to be done for this particular patient in this particular case. Okay. So you need to <clears throat> optimize the cardiovascular system of the patient. And the biggest problem in all these cases is perioperative AKI, which is detected in about 22 to 57 percent of the ICU patients. And this happens mainly because of the perioperative hypotension and hyperenal hypoperfusion, which often, you know, gets undercorrected or delayed decisions, which are responsible for your perioperative AKI. And the current AKI classification underestimates the long-term mortality, which that acute kidney injury is going to, AKI is acute kidney injury, which is going to hamper the patient's long-term uh, survival. Okay. So the, uh, the treatment for this is the optimization of volume status. Now, traditionally, the methods used, volume status, matlab, your preload. What is preload? Preload is the end diastolic volume or whatever is the volume in your uh, ventricles at the end of diastole, whatever returns to the heart from the venous system at the end of diastole. Okay, so that is what is the filling of your heart, which is your preload. Okay, so now initially it used to be measured by parameters like your CVP, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, left ventricular end diastolic dimensions, or your diastolic weights. And multiple studies have shown that they are not in they are not accurate measurements. So the problem is they indicate the fluid status but they don't accurately correct the responsiveness of the fluid, okay? And why is this fluid responsiveness so important? So like you can see in the Frank Starling curve on my uh, screen, so the heart will respond to, a flu to the fluid up to a point, okay? It is up to that point that you can give fluid to the patient. But once you go beyond, and if you still continue administrating fluid to this particular patient, now you are going to go into a downward slope. So you are going to hamper the cardiac functioning of the patient. And that is why it is important to know if your patient is low on preload or requires fluid and up to what point is the patient going to accept that fluid and if you need to change your line of management. So basically, it helps you guide the management of the patient in the OT or in your IC. So now we have moved from all these tests to uh, pulse pressure variation, pulse uh, plate variability index or your stroke volume variation. So what do these uh, waveforms? So these are basically waveforms and they are beat to beat. And what do they indicate is that is how respiration 
causes variations in this waveform. And that is very sensitive to your changes in the ventricular preload. Okay. So this is usually done in a mechanically ventilated patient with sinus rhythm. So that is exactly what your limitation is going to be. So if you have a spontaneous breathing patient or the one, or one with arrhythmias, then your pulse pressure variation or these variation indices are not that sensitive. Okay, so all this will help you guide the management, like I said. So this is called as GDMT, Goal Directed Management Therapy. Okay, so when you monitor your stroke volume variation, uh, so this most of you must have seen this flow chart. I'll just tell you in a minute. If it is more than 12%, you give fluid. If it comes down to less than uh, 8%, the stroke volume variation, you assess the blood pressure. If your blood pressure is within the normal range, good enough. If it is not, you assess your cardiac index. If the cardiac index is low, so your cardiac index is your cardiac output. So if your cardiac output is low, you add an inotropic agent, which will help improve the contractility. If your cardiac output is de decent enough, so your contractility is good, your volume status is good, so you need to add a vasoconstrictor. Okay, so basically this is just to summarize, okay. Now, uh, these are some of the definitions that we have been discussing. So, most of it you all must be al already knowing. Okay, because of shortage of time, I'll just rush through all of this preload. So, just these two definitions that I really want you all to know. Preload, it is a tension developed in the ventricular wall at end system. Okay, just prior to contraction. Okay, so it is difficult to measure and end diastolic pressure is just taken as a surrogate. So your, the end diastolic volume, which is responsible for that pressure is what we are looking at for the preload. Okay, mainly determined by the venous return, like I mentioned, and it is a filling pressure of the ventricle. Okay, then comes the afterload. Okay, so the afterload is the end systolic wall stress. Okay, against which your LV has to basically eject. Okay, so your, so that can be summarized as your systemic vascular resistance, okay, to summarize. So just to, uh, for the sake of simplicity, preload is your end diastolic volume and hence the end diastolic pressure that is the filling and your afterload is basically your systemic vascular resistance, which is dependent on your arterial blood pressure. Okay, what are the clinical indicators? So when you say monitoring, we also need to know how would you monitor this case clinically. So heart rate, absence of tachycardia, blood pressure, which is maintained within the normal range, pulse strength at various sites. So your peripheral pulses, central pulses, patient color. So whether you have a pale patient or a uh, the uh, like a warm, warm uh, red, uh, non flushed patient the respiratory rate, if your patient is too tachypneic, okay, if your peripheries are very cold, all these are indicators of low cardiac output and hence poor organ perfusion, urine output, low urine output, poor organ perfusion, capillary refill time, poor organ perfusion and hence low cardiac output, cognitive function. So if you have a patient who is drowsy, giddy, so that again, all this comes down to a suspicion of low cardiac output. Okay, so change in heart rate, blood pressure and CVP in response to leg raise test. Okay, but when you don't have monitors available, so then if your patient responds to leg raising, you can give fluid bolus. Patient is responsive to fluid. Lactates and base deficits. Okay, lactates and base deficit improves when the oxygen delivery improves. And that means when the cardiac output improves. Okay. Then uh, oxygen saturation in the central venous blood is also a good indicator of uh, directly fluid therapy because it's a, a surrogate marker for mixed venous oxygen saturation. So, uh, so this was a quick review of what most of the things we already know, but why we are so concerned about this cardiac output monitoring. Okay, so we need to know that before we start discussing the cardiac output monitoring. Okay. So this is a flow chart. Okay, there are different ways of classifying cardiac output monitoring. You can do it by the primary method, which is used for calibration, calibrating the device or the principle on which the working of the device is based. You can classify them as based on their invasiveness. So 